I'm Mark Rees, and welcome to my curious ghosts and folklore podcast, where in each episode I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And this episode is dedicated to one of my favourite subjects, ghost trains. I've got an incredible real-life story about a ghost train which was said to be hurtling around the Welsh countryside back in the 19th century. And not just any ghost train. This real-life story involves a ghost train from the future. Yes, a time-travelling ghost train. There are not many ghost stories out there about time-travelling ghost trains. It's like Back to the Future meets Night of the Demon. It's all a bit, all a bit steampunk. And the great thing about doing an episode about ghost trains is that, as regular listeners will know, I love a terrible sound effect. And I can start this episode with a sound effect. And it also means I can use a quote from the film Ghostbusters to get things going. And that quote is, Heck, my grandma used to spin yarns about a spectral locomotive that would rocket past the farm where she grew up. Because while this story takes place in Wales and not New York in 1984, it still involves a spectral locomotive which rockets past a farm. And the third and final reason I love this subject is that about a year or so ago, I decided to track down all of the surviving ghost trains in Wales. And and by that, I mean the, the ghost trains in fun fairs and places, the rides. I don't mean literal ghostly trains. And one of the, the, the quite sad things about this is that I could only find... A handful. And now this might be because I wasn't looking in the right places or I wasn't looking hard enough. And I hope that's the reason. But it could also be that maybe they are a dying breed. Maybe the reason I couldn't find many is that they simply don't exist anymore. In which case, I hope that we can, in some small way, by talking about this subject and raising this subject not only stop this trend, but reverse it. How, how great would it be to have ghost trains all over the place again? So let's bring back ghost trains to all fun fairs, you know, and not just in Wales, over the world. Wherever you are in the world, let's get ghost trains back in the fairs. Now, as a result of this search for ghost trains to ride, I tracked one down which I hadn't been to before, or somebody suggested on social media that I should visit, in Folly Farm in Pembrokeshire, which, according to a quick internet search, just to find out how they like to describe this place, it is the perfect family day out, and it is the best animal day out, in inverted commas there. And in fairness, I mean, I, I wasn't there for the animals personally, but, you know, I, I liked the lions, I liked the penguins, and that seemed to be the main reason everyone else was there. I was the only person inside waiting to get on the ghost train. There was nobody even manning it. It, it was the height of summer, everyone else was outside, I was the big weirdo, the, the, the funny goth guy, waiting to get on a ghost train. And as an added bonus, they had the Ghostbusters pinball machine, which I hadn't seen before in the flesh. So that was a nice, a nice bonus while I was waiting. But anyway, I went to Folly Farm to get on this ghost train, and it was short, and it was sweet, and it was fun, and it, it pretty much ticked the boxes for a ghost train, which, let's be honest, is aimed at people a heck of a lot younger than I am. And the the creatures inhabiting it, some of them were figures, some were life-size models, and a lot of them were paintings, which varied from the more cartoony fairy tale characters up to more sort of Rob Zombie-ish looking, looking people. And 
Overall, I, I enjoyed the experience. I enjoyed my day out. Thumbs up to Folly Farm. Just for having a ghost train is good enough for me. And, you know, my, my one quibble was it was a bit short and sweet. But, you know, you can just jump back on and, and have as many goes as you want. You can go round and round to your heart's content. Now, I've been racking my brain trying to think of some terrifying experiences when I was young, when I was experiencing these ghost trains at, you know, at the age you should be experiencing them for the first time. And the one that really sticks in my mind, and I'll, I'll tell you this quick anecdote, and then I will open up the archives and blow the dust off this real-life case and tell you all about the real-life ghost train in a second. But first, my recollection of the spookiest time was not technically on a ghost train, but it was very close to one, less than two minutes away, and this was in Porthcall. Porthcall Funfair, Coney Beach Funfair, on the south southeast coast of Wales, and Porthcall Funfair is it's pretty much the king of that kind of 1970s feeling funfair in in a good way that good old traditional funfair and they had the traditional ghost train there which in my most recent memory of the place had christopher lee the great christopher lee as dracula painted on the top he was holding his cape open and so as you stepped into the ride onto the train you were effectively walking into the clutches, into the arms of Dracula, of Christopher Lee's Hammer Horror Dracula. Now, that was the ghost train itself, which I was very familiar with from riding on in my younger years. But just around the corner, there was a second horror-themed ride. Now, sadly, I can't for the life of me remember the name of it. I've racked my brain. I've done internet search after internet search. And all I get is the ghost train, not the ride just around the corner. And I am sure as soon as I finish this podcast and upload it, the name will come back to me. But for now, I am just going to call it the Castle of Terror. That's not the name, but I can't think of anything else. So for the purposes of this podcast, it is the Castle of Terror. And if anyone out there is familiar with this ride, please correct me. Let me know on social media. So if it ever gets mentioned again, I will know. But this Castle of Terror, I never went into as a youngster. And I think... Partly that might have been because there was an age limit on it. I don't think it was suitable for very young people. And to look at it, you could tell immediately this was a much more intense affair than Christopher Lee's ghost ride around the corner. They had life-size characters in the windows and by life-size adults. So as a child, these are towering over you. And they looked like extras from a a Conan the Barbarian film or something. They were there, covered in muscles, wearing next to nothing, just these little fluffy pants or whatever coat, whatever you call those things Conan wears. And they were holding snarling wolves on, on chains, I think, as leashes. But the whole effect before you even entered the doors was that this is going to be an intense, scary affair. Now, in my teenage years, when I was back there with some friends, that was the first time I ever entered this other horror ride. And upon doing so, we got quite spooked quite quickly because this place was dark. And when I say dark, I don't mean You couldn't see much. You could see nothing, literally nothing. There was no safety lights. There was no lights on the ground. There was no lights in the cracks in the walls. There was literally nothing whatsoever. We were fumbling around blindly with our hands on the walls, trying to find anything. And we we seemed to be knocking over boxes. We seemed to be knocking over bits of wood. And it felt like, I imagine, the escape room games must be for people nowadays. But the big difference is that people pay and choose to go into escape games. We had not. We thought we were just walking through a castle of terror. And now we found ourselves in pitch blackness with no idea how to escape. And if the intention was to terrify people, they had succeeded. And it took us quite some time until finally... One of my friends found a door handle 
And upon opening that door, upon pushing the handle down, I can remember just being blinded by sunlight which poured into that cavernous dark room. And if we'd been vampires, that, that would have been the end of us. This sunlight would have just incinerated us. It was like when you see in films where people pull down the curtain quickly and the vampires turn to dust. But in our case, we just poured out of that room as quickly as we could, expecting to land in the next room in the Castle of Terror. But that is not what happened. Instead, we actually found ourselves outside on the street or somewhere because a few minutes ago we were in this big funfair complex inside the castle of terror now it was like walking through a portal into the twilight zone and appearing outside in the streets and we had to go full circle walk all the way back round back into the entrance of the fair and back up to the front counter and to ask the people what what the heck is going on is that the ride now this was many years many decades ago now so i can't for the life of me, remember what the explanation they gave us was for this happening. But it turns out that we had walked into some kind of storage cupboard. And we had spent, what, ten minutes? It, it felt like ten hours desperately trying to find a way out of this haunted castle. Which, as I now know, was not a haunted castle. In fact, it was just where they kept the mops and the cleaning products or whatever, whatever it was we were knocking over in there. But that's enough of my personal terrifying experiences at Funfez. Let's look at a more terrifying real life experience with a ghost train. And this one, as with the majority of my old ghost stories, has been put together from the archives from the old newspaper accounts. And this one dates from 1864 and it takes place in Carmarthenshire in the west of Wales. Specifically, in a small town called Whitland, which is on the River Taff, which will become important later on, and which does indeed have a train station. Now, before we get into the spooky things, I think it's important to stress how much of an impact the arrival of the train, the steam train, was having on the lives of people. This was a life-changing invention. If you had never encountered something like a steam train before, to see that this, this, this demonic thing just hurtling out of the darkness towards you must have been a terrifying experience for people who for decades, for generations, had been living idyllic lives in the countryside. And now from out of nowhere, these metallic tracks have started spider webbing across the country into your backyard and now this 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 fire breathing noisy clanking machine is a part of your everyday life and what i'd like to do is to quickly quote from a television series which was on the bbc a few years ago because this this really stuck with me and it was on a program called the art of gothic presented by the art historian Andrew Graham Dixon. And one of the pieces of art he singled out as being particularly gothic. Amongst all these paintings of the stereotypically gothic, I guess, of witches and devils and demons and skeletons and the fevered imaginations of the likes of Goya and Henry Fuseli, he also chose... J.M.W. Turner's very well-known painting of a train entitled Rain, Steam and Speed, The Great Western Railway. Now, you might be familiar with this painting. It's quite a famous one. If not, and you are able to, I'd recommend having a quick internet search for it. But regardless, that name alone, Rain, Steam and Speed, The Great Western Railway, doesn't sound particularly gothic in and of itself. It sounds quite, it sounds quite the opposite, the Great Western Railway. It sounds like a nice day out. But as mentioned, this was painted at a time when this was all new and not 
welcomed with open arms by everyone. Some people were anxious and apprehensive as a result. And what I'd like to do is just to quote a quick line from that episode where the presenter tells us what this painting is really about as far as he is concerned. And he said, it's about this dark, clanking automaton. This creation of science that is running out of control. There's terror and it lives at the heart of Victorian England. That's gothic. And I think that description, with the exception of the word England, of course, this story takes place in Victorian Wales, but I think that description perfectly sets the scene and puts you in the frame of mind of these people who would have been encountering these trains encroaching into their land for the first time. And that is why this ghost train is called the ghost train from the future. And as will become clear, we can look at that in two different ways nowadays. I mean, we can simply take it as the ghost train from the future because these steam trains were seen as these satanic scientific beasts flying across the land. But it could also be taken more literally, as in it is a ghost train which has travelled back in time from the future. All will be revealed very soon. Or maybe you'll have more questions than answers soon. But either way, this tale begins with a farmer who in 1864 claimed to have seen the ghost of a train before the train had even arrived. And I don't just mean half an hour early or something. I mean before the tracks had even been laid for this train to travel upon. This really was, according to this farmer, a ghost train from the future. Now, that might sound like quite a a, a confusing way to start this story, and the reporter covering it did suggest that maybe it was some sort of clairvoyance in action. And to quote, he said, the Welsh are said to be endowed with the power of prophecy or second sight. Now, I, I wasn't aware of that myself. I can, I can only talk from personal experience. But as far as I'm aware, I don't have prophecy or second sight. But this reporter believed this farmer might have had these abilities. And what I'd like to do now is to read to you a part of the report describing the exact events. One dark and lonely night in Carmarthenshire, where our farmer and his friend had been enjoying a day's fishing in the Tav, an excellent trouting stream that runs past the old abbey of Whitland. As evening drew on, the sport grew slack, and at last the trout gave up taking at all. So the sportsmen put up their tackle, said good night, and departed on their several roads homeward. So the two friends, after a nice day's fishing, after the shades of night had fallen and the trout had fallen asleep, or or at least given up biting, they decided to call it a day and went their separate ways. Now, it was as the farmer was returning to his farm, walking alone at this point, that he stopped to light his pipe. He liked to smoke as he was walking about at night and... As he did so, he became conscious of an indescribable sensation. The air seemed full of sound, and yet was perfectly silent. As he stood, perplexed, not to say alarmed, strange noises began to issue from the ground. The hill trembled beneath his feet. His pipe dropped from his hand. And he was on the point of running away when a long whistling shriek accompanied by the sound of a thousand wheels burst from the hillside close behind him. 
A number of horses feed in close by, pricked up their ears and galloped wildly down the hill, jumping right into the bed of the tav, where they stood panting and frightened until the strange sound died away in the distance. So that was quite an experience, quite an encounter with something that the farmer had. And he was not alone. Whatever was causing these feelings, these sounds, these sensations was also felt by the animals, by the horses there who fled in fear into the tav. The farmer rushed home, he left his pipe behind, he had more important things on his mind, and he was filled with this feeling of of apprehension that some terrible calamity was going to happen to him or his family. Now, maybe this is where the idea of of clairvoyance and things comes into it, because if he, he could not explain what had happened, he just knew it was not good. (laughs) Whatever this was, it is a sign of something bad coming your way. But it would appear it was not a family tragedy. And I'll quote this next bit. Sometime afterwards, the line for the South Wales Railway was surveyed and a tunnel at last completed, the mouth of which opened at the very spot from whence, as was now explained, a spectral train had issued. And... Upon the opening day, the farmer and a crowd of country folk were upon the spot to witness the effect, which certainly exactly answered the description as given by him, even to the horses galloping into the tav. Which I'm taking to mean that the horses did exactly the same thing when the rail train arrived as they had done when this spectral train arrived was seen and felt by the farmer in a spot where it would have emerged from the tunnel and created that effect. Now, there are not many ghost stories that deal with ghosts from the future. Most ghosts are ghosts from the past. They are medieval knights who clank about the place, not Marty McFly or somebody coming back the other direction. But that is exactly what we've got in this case. And maybe, maybe Marty McFly is a bad example because this was not a person. This was a, a mode of transport. It was a train. Maybe it, it would be the equivalent of the ghost of the DeLorean coming back to haunt us now. But either way, I find this a very fascinating one-off story. I I can't offer an explanation. I don't know if clairvoyance and second sight could explain seeing the ghost of a train long before the tunnel has even been built for it to emerge from. But there you go. That's the that's the report from 1864, and they are the events as recorded. And as somebody who loves a ghost train. I love any real-life ghost story that claims to have a ghost train in it, even if I have no chance of explaining what went on. But maybe you do. Maybe you know of other stories of ghost trains, similar stories, or totally different stories of ghost trains from around the world, which might help explain this. If so, please get in touch. It's always great to hear from people, even if you just want to say, hello, how's it going? Or to compliment me on my incredible work with the sound effects on this episode. You can track me down on social media or from my website. My website has the contact information as well as links to all of my social media accounts. But if you just do a search for Mark Reese and put ghosts or whales in or something, I will pop up on the top of the search and we can have a chat all about this on social media. Also, it's now time for my very quick 10 second shout out about subscribing. But if you have enjoyed this episode about the ghost train and you would like to hear more spooky stories, I've got a heck of a lot more coming up over the next few weeks and months and years please consider hitting the subscribe button because that way you will never miss an episode ever and it puts a smile on my face because I know people are listening. And of course, the other benefit of subscribing 
is that you never miss any of my rubbish sound effects. Now, I, I fought the urge throughout this episode, but I did, as with previous episodes, I, I am a bit of a cheapskate, and I do go looking for free sound effects. And as such, I have no real right to complain, really, because, you know, I, I don't pay for these things. Nevertheless, it does baffle me how, how some of these are are presented to the world. And I think my favourite weird train noise of all during my hunt for this episode is this particular effect. And what I'd like you to do is to listen to this very, very carefully and have a quick guess what you think this sound effect might be representing. Now, that, that, that's enough. Believe it or not, that actually goes on for something like two, two minutes, 40 seconds. We just had about eight seconds, and I think eight seconds is plenty. Now, I don't know what you've guessed that sound might be, but I can promise you, you are wrong. <laughs> or I, I should say you are 99.9% .9 wrong. You can never rule out some amazingly obscure guess, but I can reveal that that sound was, and bear in mind, I was looking for noises of trains. I wanted whistles and wheels, train noises. This is the soundscape in a Eurostar toilet. Somebody spent the best part of three minutes recording the soundscape in the toilets on a Eurostar. I'm just as lost for words as you are. But there you go, it's always nice to finish on a high, and on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening to this Ghost Train episode, and starting next episode is the big countdown to Halloween. I have got some incredible surprises lined up for the entire month of October up to the big day, including the launch, my online podcast launch of my new book, Paranormal Wales, on October the 29th. And even though it is a podcast, I will be doing a Q&A session at the end of that, like a normal book launch. So if anyone out there would like to send me any questions for inclusion on that episode, I will do my best to include them as, as long as they aren't, you know, they, they aren't rude or anything. I will include them in this podcast. And until then, thank you very much for listening. Diolch and Varian am Grando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast. It's the best. It's the beautiful. It's the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And on that note, I'm going to go and hop on a spectral locomotive and rock it past the farm just down the road. Until next time, no star.